Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. My name is Luke. I'm a producer here at How to Academy and welcome to what I'm sure is going to be an amazing event. Today we are very lucky to be joined by David Wengro, Professor of Comparative Archaeology at University College London and Visiting Professor at New York University. When David is not conducting archaeological digs in Africa and the Middle East, he writes excellent books. His most recent, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity, was co-written with the late, great David Graeber and is out now. Today, Professor Wengro will be in conversation with Yanis Varoufakis, ex-finance minister of Greece, co-founder of the international grassroots democratization movement, DM25, and current professor of economics at the University of Athens and Greek member of parliament. Today, David and Yanis will be discussing a very simple topic, the origins of human civilization, specifically how much we have gotten wrong about our prehistory and how we can use a new understanding to shape our future. So after a 45 minute or so conversation, David will take questions from you, the audience. So please type any you have wherever your Q&A function is on your screen and Yanis will get to them a little bit later. Well, that's more than enough from me. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Yanis Varoufakis and David Wengro. Yanis, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to uh, How To Academy. Thank you, David, for um, you know, uh, making yourself available to have a chat with um, uh, a very enthusiastic reader of your book. I think it would be remiss of us not to begin with a few words um, regarding the person who is not here with us, tragically, today, tonight, um, David Graeber. Uh, I have to you know, for pu the purposes of full disclosure, say that I actually never met David. I exchanged many emails. Um, uh, we had telephone conversations. Um, I received his support and I tried to return it in kind uh, at difficult moments in my life, but I actually never met him. And tragically, it's not going to be. So David, um, I'm passing the microphone over to you with just one comment about your joint effort with uh, the other David. Reading through the pages of what is very clearly a substantial contribution to our understanding of humanity, the one thing that I take away from it um, at the level of sentiment and aesthetic as well, is that it was written in a great spirit of fun. You seem to be having fun while writing it. Is that so? A hundred percent. It was so much fun that when we finished the first draft of the manuscript completely, um, which was only about uh, three weeks uh, before David passed away, uh, we were both deeply depressed. I can vividly remember a, a phone call from uh, Safia, where, where my wife is from, uh, David was in, in London at the time, I think, where it, it was one of the most miserable phone conversations. I think either of us said, oh, it's finished, you know, what, what are we going to do for fun <laughs> now? Well, you know, can't possibly just go back to our day jobs. Um, so we immediately, actually David uh, insisted, uh, I don't know why, but he, he fixated upon the idea of writing three sequels whether it was some kind of Tolkien uh, fixation. Uh, if it was a Tolkien fixation, it was all topsy-turvy because, of course, the first one's meant to be rather short. And then you do The Lord of the Rings. But I, I think we, we did The Lord of the Rings first, maybe. And then anyway, so he, he immediately said, well, we just, we just carry on. It's not finished. You know, we hand it over to the publisher and we, we immediately, um, we just keep going because uh, it's full of these concepts which are... Um, as we as we quite freely admit, you know, that they're, they're not fully tried out. They haven't been uh, road tested to anything like the degree that that um, we uh, we would want them to be. And uh, one of my uh, uh, hopes for the book uh, is that some of these ideas will be taken up by other people, not necessarily researchers, but uh, also artists or just anyone who's really interested. Um, and extended to other parts of the world, other periods of, of history. So it's not a, um, despite the, uh, the superficial appearance of the book, um, it doesn't claim to be an authoritative or comprehensive study, um, but it does claim to be a, a, a new uh, 
way, or at least an invitation to a new way of looking uh, at human history and the history of civilization? Well, it must be quite daunting to be writing about societies and communities uh, from the Ice Age all the way to the, the, the earliest of states. And I wonder how, you know, how you, you pluck up the courage to do that. But it is remarkable how you have made prehistory sexy. Because prehistory is usually something that, you know, we just um, dismiss, at least us who are not archaeologists, who are not anthropologists. We go through it, through it quickly. It is uh, um, the kind of straw man and woman that uh, we conjure up in yeah. order to build up our own history of history. Um, so prehistory is usually dismissed as a homogeneous, boring, um, rather primitive kind of thing yes, that is uh, set aside. Great, uh, sort of primordial soup, as we say somewhere, from which right. structure one day uh, emerged. But the funny thing is, it's, it's really not difficult to make prehistory sexy if you actually look at the facts and, and the details. Um, something we say very early on in the book, I think right at the beginning, um, is that the conventional narratives, uh, which most of us are familiar with of human history, uh, quite apart from being divorced from a lot of the facts, they just make human history unnecessarily boring and mm -hmm. dull. They flatten everything out. Uh, it's almost as if it were a, a prerequisite for telling those stories that we turn our ancestors into these kind of cardboard cutouts who lived a long time ago in societies that were really nothing like ours uh, in any sense, even in the sense that they weren't really conscious that they were building societies at all around any particular set of values or any notion of the human good or the human bad, um, but, you know, we're asked to imagine people who were simply adapting to their environments or who were taking part in some kind of inexorable process that we can understand as a process of evolution, but which they themselves were completely unconscious of, supposedly. And this is the, um, I think this is what you're referring to, if I understand you correctly, by this idea that, you know, nothing much happened before the invention of agriculture. Whereas actually what archaeologists have discovered over the past 40 or 50 years is that this couldn't be further from the truth. It doesn't matter where you dig or, or survey everywhere from uh, Japan to Central America, what you see before the so-called agricultural revolution is nothing like that at all. It's not this picture of uh, uh, culturally deprived people living in some state of, uh, of uh, simplicity. Um, actually, you see this incredible variety. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples uh, in, uh, in North America, in the state of Louisiana, uh, there are earthworks, which are three and a half thousand or so years old at a place called Poverty Point, which are really the size of a, an urban sort of conurbation put together by people who didn't practice farming, hunter-gatherers who came together probably at specific times of year and built something that resembles a, a kind of series of amphitheaters. I mean, we must be talking about publics gathering in their thousands. Um, doesn't fit even remotely the idea that before the coming of agriculture, all you had was egalitarian, tiny bands of 10 or 20 people roaming around the landscape. Uh, quite the opposite, you know, this is a kind of hunter-gatherer metropolis before farming. And there are similarly striking examples that deviate from that stereotypical uh, notion of hunter-gatherers on every continent of the world. When I first read uh, David's other great book, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, mm. as an economist, I felt so relieved that I was not alone, that somebody else believed or understood that the barter myth was just a barter myth and that money did not simply correct the failures of barter, but mm. it um, predates it, you know, it, the, the, the whole notion of fictional capital. Um, predates even agriculture or coincides with the invention of agriculture. So, yeah, David busted that myth, the barter myth, beautifully in that book. And what you seem to be doing 
with uh, the dawn of everything is that you're busting the other myth that um, mm -hmm. uh, there is some kind of vector, historical vector, taking us from uh, simplicity to complexity. Mm -hmm. that, uh, prehistory, prehistoric societies were simple and boring, and uh, with uh, technological change, uh, we had hierarchy because we had complexity. Mm -hmm. By mm -hmm. demonstrating, as we just said, from using the example of Louisiana, that there was plenty of complexity back there, then mm. Mm, suddenly the notion that uh, autocratic hierarchical regimes uh, are the result of technological change because of the complexity that is created, mm -hmm. um, that is busted just as uh, uh, beautifully as the, the barter myth was uh, busted by David's previous work. Well, we try and pay attention to the structure that exists in both camps, both in the camp of hierarchy and in the camp of anti-authoritarian or more egalitarian kinds of social movements. Um, because I think you're quite right. The, the dominant story that's told of human history makes hierarchy seem like an intrinsic feature of structure and vice versa, so that everything else is kind of amorphous. It doesn't really have a direction. Um, there's one very striking example that we talk about in the book of these remarkable settlements north of the Black Sea, which are as ancient as the first cities in the Middle East, in ancient Mesopotamia. But they're generally not defined as cities. They don't have a part in that dominant narrative of how we went from small scale to large scale societies, because the dominant idea of a city is precisely some kind of ancient megalopolis with some equivalent to a, a financial district in the middle of it, whether it's palaces or temples um, or factories. Um, but in fact, these uh, other kinds of settlements, although they're on an urban scale, they're completely decentralized. Tens of thousands of people coming together, uh, finding a way of coexisting um, without any of those traces of structural inequality. They actually, the settlement plans look like these great uh, concentric rings of houses. Um, and of course, you know, then immediately our minds turn to another stereotype, which is that equality means homogeneity. Equality must mean some kind of, you know, rather drab existence based on the principle that everyone is the same. But actually, when archaeologists go down to the details of people's family lives, their domestic lives within these big egalitarian cities, they find quite the opposite. Actually, every house is a little bit different. It has a, a different uh, aesthetic style. You can see it in the pottery and the, the everyday crockery, the equipment used for eating and drinking. It looks more like some sort of vast artist's colony or something. And there's another example of this that we talk about in, um, in Mexico, in the Valley of Mexico, the ancient city of Teotihuacan, which seems to have developed the most incredible project of uh, social housing with people living uh, quite uniformly uh, to very, very high standards, uh, uh, very good quality of life. Um, and again, when we talk about social housing or public housing, I guess the image that comes to most people's minds is of, you know, a great tower block that flattens out all the differences between people. But in this case, we know that this was a multi-ethnic city uh, of about 100,000 uh, individuals who spoke multiple languages, came from different parts of, uh, of uh, Mesoamerica. Um, and that diversity uh, doesn't seem to have been opposed in any way to the creation of a, a more egalitarian uh, and equal, uh, equally distributed uh, urban infrastructure. Um, so we spend quite a bit of time in the book um, tackling those binaries, you know, the things that we assume must necessarily be opposed to one another. Actually, the evidence of history and archaeology um, often shows that they don't need to exist in opposition. And that other things which, uh, which we, we tend to think of as unities actually did begin in opposition to each other, like our whole notion of states and what is a, what is a nation state, for example. Now, of course, uh, one of the contributions of the book is that it um, reminds us, if you haven't discovered that, but you remind us very vividly of the tendency that we all have 
to look to the past and project our own assumptions yeah. on uh, long dead people and communities. Um, f f economists are even worse, uh, at least mainstream economists. They project Robinson Crusoe upon everyone and they create the, 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 you know, the concept of the liberal capitalist individual uh, whenever they see, uh, you know, they, they excavate uh, a site and they discover a 3,000 old dead person. Uh, but just to play the devil's advocate, David, um, when, when you use terms like social housing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or egalitarian cities, mm -hmm. are you not opening yourself up to the criticism that um, you're projecting your own political mm -hmm. ideals upon finds that may or may not contain evidence to back up your own assumptions? Well, I think it's about, uh, I mean, it's, it's a reasonable point and, and we've certainly, I've certainly had to deal with criticisms of that nature. I think it's about where you set the evidence bar. Uh, and whether that is done in uh, in an equitable way. So if you want to talk about um, a hierarchical city, uh, a city with um, kings and aristocrats and, uh, and uh, centrally uh, uh, organized top-down administration and so on, the evidence bar in archaeology is very low. You can more or less look at any large settlement and say, oh, almost the automatic assumption is that any kind of large-scale organization must be some variation on a state or a kingdom or an empire. Um, and you're not really asked to substantiate that or subject it to a great deal of scrutiny. But the minute that you try to identify something that isn't uh, that kind of stratified hierarchical structure, it seems to me that the, the expectation of proof uh, goes up uh, inordinately. Now, this is nothing to do with empiricism. It's nothing to do with science. I think it's to do uh, with quite the opposite. It's to do with some very ingrained, uh, quite unreflective tendencies to assume that hierarchy is normative in any kind of large-scale social agglomeration. Um, so the accus accusation, I think, it thrusts both ways. For example, I mean, it's quite funny that you talk about economics. One of the, the, the things that motivated us to get going on this project was a whole spate of books and studies that came out directly in the wake of the, the big financial crash, 2008-9, on the, the roots of inequality. And many of these had a strong historical dimension. They weren't content with just looking at what's happened since the Industrial Revolution. They try and, and pursue a, a thesis about the origins of inequality all the way back to the Ice Age or beyond. But they do it through a kind of economization of history, applying tools taken from books like Piketty's uh, work on capital, the Gini, is it Gini or Gini coefficient? I can finally ask somebody who actually knows the answer. It's the Gini, the Gini coefficient. Gini, it's, it was an Ita Italian <laughs> economist, right? Yeah, well, the, the English call it, I mean, I'm Anglo-trained. We, in the Anglosphere, call it the Gini coefficient. Gini coefficient. So, you know, you actually have studies by serious people with full academic credentials tracing Gini coefficients for Ice Age mammoth hunters and telling us what their, uh, you know, projected income level would have been in dollars and cents. Um, now, um, of course. They, did the, did they they assume a... capitalism to have been a fixture right. from, from, from the Ice Age. I would like to put the if question... You, if, you, if, if you read Charles Darwin's introduction, mm -hmm. okay, um, to, 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 to his famous book, he, you'll find that Thomas Malthus is the one who actually guided him to the idea of the struggle of uh -huh. population. Um, so the, the whole right. idea of natural selection comes from a Victorian perspective of capitalism. Uh -huh. and, uh, now, it so happened that in the case of Darwin, it didn't harm him because this fallacious assumption led him to a correct theory. But um, yeah. our, the capacity of those who have been nurtured within capitalism to see capitalism in prehistory is mind-boggling. So, you know, in a way, I think you've just answered the question that you asked me. I mean, if there's a criticism to be leveled about 
um, projecting one's own biases, you couldn't possibly find a more obvious example than this kind of uh, plutocratic uh, notion of, of human history. I mean, it's so obviously a reflection of our own preconceptions with private property, with, with money, um, and with growth uh, in the sense that the Gini, co Gini coefficients um, you know, they always come out very low at the start of the story. So we have to imagine Ice Age hunter-gatherers with, um, you know, incredibly low incomes. I think the, it was it was projected as something like a dollar fifty a day or something crazy. Um, I don't know what this is even based on, but it's so obviously a reflection of our own preconceptions that I'd like to think that you know we're quite transparent about this in the book. We actually say, well, we don't really have a language for this, uh, an egalitarian city. What do we mean? Do we mean a democracy? Do we mean a republic? How do we tell without written sources? So we're quite open and frank about this. But what we don't try to do, which I think uh, uh, you can find in some other studies, is to just try and unsee it all as if it's not there. So where we have things like aristocratic burials in the last ice age that look like royal burials, we don't just ignore them and say, oh, they were all living in egalitarian societies. We ask, how is it possible to understand the existence of a society that treats some of its members like royalty some of the time, but never seems to coalesce into any kind of permanent uh, stratified uh, social formation? How could one understand that? And that's where the anthropology and David Greber's deep understanding of the ethnographic record was essential because it's, we found it's not really enough to just pile up all of this data and all of this, uh, these facts, this information. Um, conceptually, you have to make a shift uh, away from that rather simplistic, uh, one-dimensional view of human societies to understand something that's much more complex and much more interesting. Well, this is what I enjoyed about your book, that. Um prehistory emerges as a phantasmagoria of uh, different political forms. Uh, With actual people in it, people who are reflecting <laughs> on the societies that they're constructing. One of the, the expressions, phrases that David um, coined, which um, I have to say I plagiarize often, uh, both uh, in academic terms, but also primarily these days because now I'm a politician, for better or for worse, for worse actually, um, in politics. And that's the, the, his famous phrase that everything could have been different or could be different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that comes out very distinctly in your book. But um, uh, yes, there was um, a timeline, there were developments, but at every point in time, things could have been different. There's no, the opposite of, of determinism. And, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I think that that's very refreshing and very good. But again, let me play devil's advocate. Um, a bit of personal history here. Uh, from a very young age, I was being bombarded by my father, who is uh, who was, um, he passed away recently. Uh, he was um, a chemical engineer, a metallurgist, but his real love was archeometry. He worked for decades um, doing research in archaeometry, and he kept bombarding me based on finds in the ancient Greek realm mm -hmm. uh, about the importance of metals. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, for instance, I remember when I was eight, nine, he would take me to these uh, digs in Thessaly and in Macedonia and various places, and he would show, he would show me various layers, and you see, look, nothing much changes in terms of the artifacts that we find until humans learn how to harden iron, the Iron Age. Mm -hmm. uh, and once, w once we move from copper to hardened iron, to steel, then history is measured, is counted, not, no longer in the millennia, but in the centuries and then later on in the decades. Mm -hmm. And he had a very strong case for that, which I have to say, has influenced me from a very young age. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? Well, I think it's, um, it's, it's a way of understanding history, which actually has a history that probably goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks, in terms of thinking of history in terms of um, 
Um, not so much technological phases as technological ages, uh, the age of iron, the age of bronze. And uh, it's, it's a way of thinking about history that's, I think, very, very deeply rooted in, in our culture, in our education, um, where, where we understand the development of human societies as a series of ruptures, often linked to the creation of things like uh, the discovery of, of advanced metallurgy, the invention of agriculture, the, the origins of writing systems. So the general picture you get of history is of uh, uh, long periods in which not a great deal changes in, in fundamental terms, in terms of the way things generally work uh, in people's interactions. And then there are supposedly a few key moments, breakthroughs, revolutions, which change everything. And afterwards, nothing can be the same. Even the sense of time, as your father was intimating, uh, changes. Uh, people's understanding of themselves changes fundamentally. Um, and I think this is very much uh, the way that most people tend to think of the, uh, the shape of human history, the shape of time. Uh, one of the points we make in the book um, is that actually the evidence we have now suggests that things we considered revolutionary things that we considered uh, the, uh, the consequences of major technological changes were actually happening all the time on much shorter time scales. So for example, uh, the idea that with the coming of agriculture uh, comes the notion of private property uh, and hierarchy. Um, actually, uh, what we can see now is that non-agricultural societies were often switching and alternating uh, between those uh, particular concepts and notions on a very regular basis, even on a seasonal basis. Within the same annual round, a society might flip over from something very unequal and hierarchical to something very uh, communal and egalitarian. So uh, we even have examples of uh, hunter-gatherer societies um, which practiced household slavery and other uh, hunter-gatherer societies which managed to abolish it. Uh, and these are fundamental transformations. I mean, at, at a philosophical level, they're really uh, things that we tend to think of as happening maybe once or twice in the course of human history. Uh, the origins of democracy, you know, we, we tend to think this is something that happened very rarely. Fifth century Athens and then, you know, maybe one or two other examples. Actually, we find evidence for it in all sorts of places. And we talk about this a bit in the book. So I think that that basic idea of human history as a series of periodic ruptures and then nothing much happens um, is, is difficult to fit these days with the evidence that we have and it also has consequences for the way that we think about technological change today you know the assumption that uh, something like artificial intelligence uh, is necessarily going to change everything we don't quite know how but there's an assumption that we're not controlling the technology we're not the ones who are fully in command of this uh, and that we're going to be sort of propelled uh, into another age where everything is different, but we can't really show how. I think this is the message you get from a lot of books about the broad sweep of history, is of humanity kind of stumbling haphazardly into these discoveries and then having to live with the consequences. It's a notion that goes all the way back to the Enlightenment and writers like Jean-Jacques Rousseau. But what we show in the book is that actually many of those key innovations were created much more in a spirit of conscious experimentation, uh, even of play, playing around, people inventing agriculture and then deciding that perhaps it doesn't really suit them and going back to foraging or perhaps combining them in all kinds of ways that we would hardly have imagined. Um, so I think that would be my, uh, not retort, but response to, uh, to your father's uh, notion of uh, science and technology. Don't you believe that capitalism changed um, hu human societies in a fundamental way and has proven that uh, there can be such a great transformation, to use a, a well-used expression, uh, which, um, um, you know, yeah, of course, there are, back, uh, there are movements backwards and forwards, uh, uh, there are oscillations, uh, 
but nevertheless it's like an iron force mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, which has transformed uh, every part of the world in a matter in a manner which um, can hardly be described as experimentation, playful experimentation and choice. Well, I think, you know, the, the, the somebody pointed out, um, it's what you've just said is exactly the kind of thing people used to say about divine kingship. It seemed entirely impossible to conceive of life without it. It was preordained. It was literally... No, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm not saying that capitalism cannot be overthrown or altered or tr transcended mm -hmm. what i am asking is don't you think that over the last 200 years more or less there was a fundamental transformation of almost every society in the world as a result mm -hmm. of the coming of the capitalist mode of production undoubtedly but i don't think that necessarily obliges us to uh, to adopt a perspective that i think it was mark fisher called capitalist realism uh, in fact, as I think you yourself has point, have pointed out, and, and as David pointed out, in many ways, capitalism in, in, in the, uh, the pure sense, the sense that, that, that was theorized by Marx and, and others, um, is over. We're, we're not living in that kind of uh, system anymore. Um, David called the present system something closer to managerial feudalism. Um, where really things are not being dictated by things like uh, the principle of free and open competition, uh, for example, um, but by something that in many ways uh, resembles the, the old pre-revolutionary uh, regimes of uh, uh, including those rates of inequality that people are so careful to, uh, to measure now. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the gap uh, between the, the haves and the have-nots, and also the way that, uh, that those who uh, are better off think of themselves uh, seems very reminiscent of some of those pre-revolutionary notions that, uh, you know, we're almost a different species. Well, you, you know, I can't argue against that because, um, as you said, it's um, a point you I, I'm, I'm on the record. Uh, I call, uh, I th in, in my view, if I may say this, uh, 2008 was to capitalism that which 1991 was to communism. It was the beginning of its end and its mm -hmm. trans transformation into what I call, I call it techno-feudalism, but it really doesn't matter. Um, but this is not about me, it's about you and your book. So let me go back to, um, it seems to me that you are aiming at, you're taking aim, and quite correctly so, uh, at, at a deterministic view of history, of prehistory and history. Mm -hmm. where people are the playthings of forces beyond their control. And you're, you want to take the idea that everything at any juncture in time could be different and has been different and could revert or move to something else and so on. So the notion of collective choice and individual choice as opposed to the deterministic uh, forces of history view. And I think that is fine. But sometimes it, you give me the impression of going too much into the choice realm um, forgetting the importance of the the forces that are nevertheless constraining us and that makes me think of the, the famous line by marx in the 18th Brumaire, um, in which he says that you know humans he said men but today we would say humans make history but not as they please not under circumstances of their choice and mm -hmm. Is it not important, do you, would you agree with me on this, that it is uh, crucial to emphasize equally the we make history, so we have, we, have, we have choices, and therefore moral responsibility, but at the same time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that material conditions, social relations of production, means of production, uh, mm -hmm. the way we organize life, um, th these are not ways in which we as human beings, communities, individuals have chosen. Well, we actually quote in the book that exact line from Marx, which we very much agree with about people making their own uh, societies, their own histories, but not necessarily under conditions of their own choosing. I think what we're arguing against is, is not so much determinism as teleology. <laughs> 
yeah, of course. The the telos of history, we we don't actually ascribe to some kind of completely laissez-faire notion of people, uh, you know, making choices in some kind of whimsical way. Actually, we we're very careful. You, you can't really avoid it with archaeology. It's inherently materialist. I mean, the evidence is all it's all physical, it's all tangible, um, which is not to say one then has to adopt a, a materialist uh, perspective, um, but all of the, uh, the reconstructions that we offer, uh, they very much come out of the ecological, the physical, the material uh, conditions of people's lives. Uh, this idea of seasonal alternations between different social and political forms, for example, is completely rooted uh, in the physical aggregation and disaggregation of, of human societies uh, within a landscape. Um, are you still with me? I'm conscious that the Wi-Fi might be playing. Up. No, I'm, I'm completely with you. Completely okay. with you. I'm just reading some of the questions that keep coming because I have to convey them mm -hmm. to you, but I'm listening to you as well. So go ahead. But what we don't subscribe to is... Um, and what we we actually um, go into some detail about why we don't subscribe to it is the idea that uh, modes of livelihood, modes of production, um, are a determining factor in social uh, and political forms. Um, so we actually look at the origins of that notion um, of the idea that it's useful or informative to divide history and human societies according to those kinds of classifications, hunter-gatherers, agriculturalists, urban industrial civilizations. Um, we spend a lot of time showing where that notion originally came from um, and why, in many ways, uh, it, it doesn't work uh, in terms of actually explaining the various transformations that we see uh, uh, in, uh, in chains of causality, uh, which just don't seem to fit uh, that kind of materialist uh, perspective. So we're not anti-materialist, but we are anti that kind of stage-like, uh, technologically driven uh, notion of, of change. Well, in a sense, you know, Rosa Luxemburg put it, from a left-wing perspective quite uh, aptly when she said it's going to be socialism or barbarism. That is the most anti-teleological statement that I've heard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, that it's whatever we make of it. <laughs> Nothing is <laughs> prefabricated. Um, before we open it up to the questions, um, yeah. there is a very intriguing, at least to me, part of the book or argument in the book, which you call the indigenous critique. Um, it's something I... I knew nothing about until you read your book, and I found it absolutely fascinating. This is, maybe you can speak to this, but I, I was uh, very surprised to, to, to read that, you know, the, 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 the hypothesis that the Enlightenment was uh, substantially informed by a critique of the West, of Europe, by indigenous scholars mm -hmm. or intellectuals, um, Native Americans in North America, mm -hmm. Uh, whose views and criticism of Europe, of colonial Europe, uh, were, uh, were conveyed to Jesuit priests or whoever it was that uh, mm -hmm. spoke to them, who then brought these views to Europe, uh, to a Europe which had not been imbued yet by the spirit or the notions of freedom, of democracy, of rights and so on, and that this indigenous critique was played an important role in bringing about the Enlightenment. That is an audacious hypothesis, if I may say. Mm -hmm. Can it's you speak not, to it? Uh, it's not a new hypothesis. Yes, I mean, it's... it's well, it's new to me because I'm an economist, right? So, you know, by definition, I'm uneducated. <laughs> it, actually, uh, it actually is well established and, and well accepted. Um, by scholars of the European Enlightenment and of the 18th century that there was such a critique and that it played a very prominent role in the writings of European philosophers of the time, often in the form of dialogues um, with an exotic uh, uh, other uh, person who casts a skeptical, critical eye back on European civilization and points out all of its faults. And almost every major Enlightenment philosopher wrote a dialogue of this kind, putting these critiques into the mouths of exotic so-called savages. Um, what is not 
generally accepted uh, is that the exotic uh, other character in these dialogues um, might have actually reflected any kind of reality. It's assumed to be as fictional as Disney's Pocahontas, if you like. But um, what we try to do in the book is to give some uh, uh, serious attention to a contrasting view uh, which has been developed by historians, particularly in Canada uh, and North America, uh, over the last few decades, which went back to some of those first-hand accounts of Europeans, Jesuits, traders, travelers, soldiers, who spent decades in the Americas, learning native languages, marrying, trading, colonizing, killing, and otherwise interacting with local people, uh, and who have pointed out that actually, in uh, at least one very important case, uh, these dialogues contain a very strong resonance with the kind of societies that existed at that time, particularly in the northeastern parts of North America, the Great Lakes region of what's now Canada and upstate uh, New York. So um, really what we're saying, I think, shouldn't be that controversial. We're simply saying that there's no particular reason to believe um, that Europeans were purely in a dialogue with themselves about these things, especially when the philosophers in question are saying, uh, we look to the people of this distant region as an inspiration for these notions of freedom and equality. Now, what's kind of interesting is that this comes back to the question of materialism and modes of production, because something we describe in, in the, uh, the second chapter of the book, I think, is how the whole notion of history as modes of production was basically created as a kind of counter-reaction a very conservative counter-reaction to the force and the power of that indigenous critique as it washed over European intellectual and literary circles. And we can actually pinpoint how this begins with the economist and uh, sort of physiocrat Anne-Robert Thiergo, who in many ways is the originator of that mm -hmm. stage-like, technologically driven notion of human history, the economization of the past. It really begins there. And the point he makes uh, in his studies on universal history is that perhaps the reason that some of these uh, uh, Native American and other remote societies can enjoy such levels of freedom and equality and women's rights and all the rest of it and can live without things like money and monarchy is not because they are in any way advanced or ahead of us or superior to us but because they are in fact primitive. They are technologically beneath us in some kind of evolutionary ladder organized precisely according to uh, uh, principles of productivity and material production, which invariably place Europe at the pinnacle, at the top, um, because that's where it was in terms of just physically being able to garner huge amounts of labor by coercion or other means and produce and export and trade. Um, so um, I think there is a relationship between uh, that kind of materialist notion of history and the, uh, the response to uh, this indigenous critique, which was essentially to take it out of the present world altogether, to relegate it to an earlier stage in time. Um, and uh, I, I think this is a very interesting moment now um, where we can go back to some of that material uh, and actually try to tell that story in a different way, which also opens up different perspectives for us. Well, perhaps this is a good moment for me to bring in a question from the audience. Then I, I will ask another question yes. about, the, about European philosophers. But I think it's quite apt. Uh, the latest question that I got here from uh, the chat um, is this, and I think it's pertinent. Is there a tendency to discount significant scholarly influence to the development of the Enlightenment by former colonized indigenous peoples of South America? Mm -hmm. Because you're talking about North America mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, you know, South America, Central America, uh, yep. there was a lot more of intermarriage, more, a lot more intercourse, maybe because of Catholicism as opposed to Protestantism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, would you like to, to speak to this? This is a great example of what I mean by the book being um, 
exploratory. It, it's a beginning. It doesn't claim to be comprehensive. The reason we focus on North America and on that particular area of North America uh, is because that's precisely the area that a French philosopher in the, uh, the middle of the 18th century would most likely have been reading about and familiar with. It was part of the, the colonies known then as New France. Mm -hmm. um, but absolutely, the, you know, for every case like that, uh, we should expect and we should, we should be looking for hundreds of other cases in completely different parts of the world. Just recently, uh, a friend and colleague of mine in Rio, in Brazil, sent me uh, some, uh, an article about a whole series of letters written uh, in uh, Tupi, transcribed from a Tupi language. Um, so uh, we're now talking about indigenous societies in, in the Southern Hemisphere, um, which are earlier than the material I'm talking about, and which seem to be along very similar lines of indigenous perspectives, uh, looking at the behavior of the Portuguese, of the colonists, and making some very pertinent assessments about the nature of their social lives and why we may not want to uh, 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 ally ourselves with them. So absolutely, you know, I, th I think this is really the tip of a much larger iceberg um, and um, would love to hear more examples from other parts of the world. And now to the question that I had before reading that particular one, uh, concerning European Enlightenment philosophy. You, you, you concentrate on two philosophers, Thomas Hobbes, the very pessimistic view of um, uh, the state of nature of an ancient societies or uh, primitive societies being uh, uh, ones in which uh, a war of all against all prevailed and life was nasty, brutish and short, which is clearly anthropologically absolutely, utterly, ridiculously wrong. But nevertheless, it was important for him in order to, to build his um, proto-liberal theory of uh, the legitimate state of the Leviathan. And then you have Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who has a completely different view of the state of nature, in which we're all fantastically beautiful, wonderful people, and then um, civilization uh, ensures that we all end up, uh, end up in chains. And then you connect, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, you connect um, contemporary thinkers like Steven Pinker, um, with uh, Hobbes and Fukuyama, with Rousseau, and so on. But from my perspective, allow me to, to bring in my own uh, um, thinking now, thinking that goes back many decades. Uh, maybe the most, I mean, you are right, Turgot is crucial uh, in terms of mm -hmm. the projection of, of Homo economicus to the past. But mm -hmm. for me, the most significant scholar and philosopher, especially from the Anglo-Scottish sphere, uh, who is a foundational thinker for contemporary mm -hmm. liberalism or libertarianism, is David Hume. Who's, uh, David Hume, yeah. David Hume, and uh, Adam yes. Smith copied, it, copied David Hume. There's nothing original okay. in Smith, at least when it comes to the, the, the theory of moral sentiments. So Hume has this view that, very similar to yours mm -hmm. and to mine, mm -hmm. in disturbing ways, because he's got this idea that we never needed a state. Uh, social conventions evolved naturally, allowed us to reduce conflict. Um, those social conventions were sufficient in order to create spontaneous order, a kind of anarchic syndicalist communal relationship between human beings. Um, and uh, reason, our rationality, has been overblown by people like Rousseau and Descartes. It's not, it's, it's, it's an important instrument, but it's just an instrument. All the, everything that's happening, which is interesting and good about society happens at the level of social conventions that learn to you know, regulate passions. Now, that to the untrained eye mm -hmm. sounds very much like you. Mm -hmm. And yet it is the foundation of the most ardent fundamentalist, free market capitalist uh, philosophy that one can think of. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you escape the embrace 
of David Hume? Well, just quickly going back to the other guys, it's not us uh, projecting Rousseau and Hobbes onto Pinker and Fukuyama. They do it themselves explicitly. Sure. No, no, of Fukuyama course. says Rousseau was right. Yeah, yeah. Pinker says Hobbes was right. You know. um, that's the only reason they come up really in, in the book initially um, is, is to deal with the neo, neo versions of those, those arguments. Um, there's another connection with David Hume, which I, I only became um, aware of quite recently, which is around the, um, the notion of property. I think it's, um, it's Hume who points to the analogy between private property and uh, the notion of the sacred, um, this sort of mumbo jumbo of, of what property really is, it has this kind of superstitious, mysterious character, um, which is also very similar actually to, to something that we argue in the book, which is that property relations are not some kind of uh, logical consequences of the adoption of farming and agriculture. Um, but actually that our notions of private property, if they resemble anything else, it's really this idea of the sacred, of something taboo, something which is surrounded by a kind of invisible force field. Um, I think, you know, where we part company uh, with Hume and with other uh, uh, overlaps, let's say, with that whole canon of European thought, um, is that we do try to take seriously contributions to social thought that come from completely outside that canon. And this becomes absolutely crucial when it comes to the topic of freedom, which is central to the arguments that we make. And we explicitly juxtapose the kinds of uh, freedoms, the notions of freedoms that we find in the philosophy of the Enlightenment and European philosophy, which tend to be either freedom from rule, freedom from sovereignty, or freedom at the price of another's captivity, freedom from slavery, which has a very broad connotation at that time, slavery meaning not just uh, uh, chattel slavery, but being at the whim of any other person. Um, what we talk about a lot in the book are other notions of freedom, which come from outside the European tradition entirely, um, and which really have nothing much to do uh, with that particular idea of freedom as the right to use and abuse one's property, for example, uh, which is very much rooted in, in the European legalistic uh, tradition, going back to medieval and ancient Roman precedents, uh, freedom uh, in the sense of ownership and possession. Um, we talk instead uh, about three basic uh, principles of freedom. Um, which are nowhere to be found in, in that tradition, but really come out of all these other examples that we consider in the course of the book of people enacting forms of freedom um, that today we find very difficult to imagine as the basis of societies. For example, the freedom to move away from one's surroundings and be welcomed in some distant location. We were talking earlier about freedom of movement and you know, the extent to which the world now is carved up into so many tiny impenetrable silos. And this is what we call globalization. What we show in the book is that actually the, the big picture of human history is really the reverse of that. We, we don't start off in tiny isolated little silos. Human beings start off in these great coalitions of societies and there's a process of shrinkage uh, which basically mm -hmm. ends with modern nation states and the divisions between them and hard barriers um, so that's a very concrete form of freedom um, just the freedom to to move away and be received uh, in a hospitable way somewhere else um, so i think you know those are the kind of points um, where we don't find ourselves limited by Hume or by the, the European canon. Uh, you know, this is the anthropological face of the book is that it tries to, to step outside of that entire uh, framework of thought and, and all its disputes.
Kevin, Kevin Andrews is asking, how long, do, how long do you think it will take before the ideas in the book will be reflected in our museums? Oh, what a great question. I think um, museums are responsible for an awful lot. I mean, it's, it's partly from the experience of, of going into big metropolitan museums, including the Metropolitan Museum in, in New York, that I think people come away with this idea that for most of human history, the world was carved up into great kingdoms and empires, and um, that, uh, you know, th this is what the, the ancient world was like, um, precisely because museums have tended to focus on fancy monuments and on the activities of aggrandizers and people who were proclaiming themselves masters of whichever universe they inhabited. I think um, museums also epitomize a principle that we talk about in the book, um, which is how uh, violence, um, the violence done in war, in colonization, um, goes from being something ephemeral to being something structural. Because of course, what museums have done historically is not just take, appropriate and curate, but also care for. Uh, objects, conserve them, um, and of course, the you know this is the the crux of the debate about ownership and repatriation. Um, so I think the the transformation of museums is absolutely central as a cultural project um, to wider transformations in society, and I, I think it's already happening to an extent. Um, I was very impressed on a visit uh, a few years ago to New Zealand, reading about the incorporation of indigenous Maori values into the whole notion of what a museum is, and that ownership and possession doesn't necessarily imply commodification, or the right to put something in a glass case and just display it as you choose. It's more about curation and consultation. Um, so I think that there are lots of steps being taken in those directions. And I think it is inevitable that they will hit the British Museum and the other major metropolitan museums of the world. It's coming. And I think the sooner they get their heads around it, the better. It's unlikely that they are ready for it, but let's see how that pans out. Um, our time is coming to a close. Uh, and I have to finish with um, a bittersweet question. Are you going to be writing the sequels? Oh, uh, I don't know, Yanis. I can't give you a, a, an honest uh, response to that because it's all been such a, a whirlwind, uh, you know, since David passed away and the book coming out and so on that I don't personally feel that I've had a chance to reflect uh, really on much of what's happened in the last year. I think a lot of people are in that position right now for a whole host of other reasons, the pandemic uh, among them. So I'm not making any, any decisions of, of that kind uh, at all. I'm just um, trying to do justice to the work that David uh, and I did together. I think that's what he'd like me uh, to be spending a, a good chunk of my time doing and trying to get the, the message of the book out there without him as, as clearly as I can manage. Um, and at some point, there'll be a chance to uh, to sit back and uh, and reflect, and also take in the responses, many, many, many responses, uh, right across the spectrum, from elated to uh, contemptuous, um, and they all deserve to be uh, thought about. Um, but that's going to take a little while, so I, I I can't give you a straight answer. <laughs> Perfectly understandable, but I have no doubt that at some point something is going to be written up by you, which is going to not provide closure to the work, but at least um, add a few important vignettes to it. Uh, David, um, thank you so much. The one hour we've been allotted has just passed. It passed as if it was five minutes, as far as I'm concerned. I hope the same thing applies to our audience. Uh, thank you everyone for watching, for asking questions. Uh, I didn't uh, um, do justice to all of them. I tried to, to pick a couple that uh, seemed pertinent.
um, I seek the forgiveness of everyone else. Thank you very much. It was great to meet you, Amos.